Hello there, good people of the world. Big Heavy back again, and I just passed my FAA Part 107 drone exam. It's technically called the Unmanned Aircraft General-Small exam. Uh, it's affectionately known as the drone exam. And in the US, it's the test you're required to take in order to, at least in the Federal Aviation Administration's eyes, be qualified to fly a drone commercially. And from what I've heard, and this is anecdotal, but you know, I've seen enough YouTube channels and similar stuff out there to back this up, the FAA is interpreting that commercially definition loosely or liberally, or depending on how you want to frame that. But essentially, I've heard of people getting takedown notices for videos they've posted to YouTube, uh, whether or not their channels are monetized, whether or not they're posting to YouTube in order to try and make money but the FAA sees you're posting a drone video on a platform that's arguably designed to make money for somebody as commercial activity. And therefore their contention is you should be a licensed drone pilot or what they call a UAS pilot. I generally try and be a good little boy and follow the rules where I can, even when I disagree with them. And I went into this initially in my research thinking it'd be something like a driver's license test where it would be practical knowledge on how to operate a drone. You know, again, similar to a driver's license, which I think in most cases are technically called operator's licenses, where they'll ask you, you know, what does a stop sign mean? What does the pedal on the right do? What does the pedal on the left do? How do you parallel park? You know, how do you get out of a skid? All these practical tests and ultimately culminating in a, you know, a practical demonstration of skills of the driving test. FAA's UAS test, on the other hand, is kind of the opposite. It's actually very much about how to fit into the broader airspace ecosystem in the United States. So the vast majority of the questions are around things like reading aviation charts, which are these maps that contain information about airports, about obstructions, about flight routes, all sorts of stuff. And you know, if you're you've never looked at one, Google, Google FAA aviation chart, you know, they're pretty intimidating and somewhat confusing the first time you see one, but they are logical. They're the method to the badness, so relatively easy to learn. There's a lot about the rules of part 107, about what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do. And frankly, a lot of the questions are a little bit nitpicky. I'm not here to give you a study guide or to recount every single question, and my memory's not good enough to, to recount all 60. But as an example, there was one about weights of a part 107 drone, and the you know, two of the choices, one of the choices was obviously wrong. One of the choices was it has to weigh 55 pounds or less, and the other was it has to weigh less than 55 pounds. So a pretty nuanced question that almost seems designed to trip somebody up that's taking this test. And broadly speaking, the two extreme interpretations of why the FAA requires this test, on one extreme is the opinion that this test is just another incidence of the man being the man. And there's probably some systemic something or other that probably originated in 1587 or some date hundreds of years ago where the man is specifically out to systemically stop you from living your best life, flying your drone, posting on YouTube, and doing your thing. The other extreme interpretation is that the United States has some of the most safe airspace in the world, and that is entirely the responsibility and the result of the good, benevolent, kind, loving men, women, and choose not to identify that work in DC at the FAA and you know, spend countless hours keeping us safe and keeping our skies safe. Like most people, I'm probably somewhere in the middle on that opinion, but you know, I tried to look at it as, hey, this is something interesting. This is content that I normally wouldn't have the opportunity to learn. I'm somebody that used to spend a lot of time in airplanes. I still spend a not unreasonable amount of time in airplanes. So it was kind of neat getting a little taste of how a pilot has to actually operate in the airspace. And I think if you look at the drone test as not how to operate a drone and how to you know, be successful manipulating a, a drone, but look at it instead as how do you fit in as a user of the airspace, you'll go in with a little better mindset. I would also add a little dose of, hey, you're going to learn some interesting trivia that probably is not relevant to any of your lives, future activities, but there's a lot of nuance to those charts. There's this whole section on weather that uses this convoluted format called MATAR. There's those little trivial questions, like I mentioned, that seem designed to trip you up. And at least when I took the test in 2022, there's some new information on there based on some recent law changes that I didn't see in a lot of the study guides, particularly around now you can fly at night without getting prior authorization. You can fly over people without getting prior authorization subject to different classes of drones and different weights and manufacturer stuff. And you can also fly over moving vehicles, which I guess was previously disallowed 
So with that all the way, in terms of what I did for the test, I'll put some links down below that I found helpful and actually used. There's a ton of paid courses out there. I didn't take any of those. I probably invested four or five hours of solid study, although I would generally consider myself smarter than the average bear. You may disagree with that and point well taken, but I am okay-ish at retaining goofy technical information that borders on trivia and being able to spit it back and or kind of apply it. So I think that type of skill helps. So if you know, you're somebody that's wired like that, I think four to five hours of study is not is going to get you passed. In my case, I was able to pull an 88 on the test. You need a 70 to pass. And there were some questions where I just had no idea. So I'll walk you through my kind of logistics and how I approach studying. So you have to go to start out to a rather convoluted FAA website. There you create an identification number with the FAA. You know, you're going to be partying like it's 1999 in terms of some of these websites and how they look, but you know, they ultimately function reasonably well. You know, it's, it's about equivalent to filling out a government form that doesn't quite make sense if you've ever you know, filled out an IRS form or something like that where just follow the instructions. You know, there's a lot of sections and references and all that stuff, but you'll eventually get through it. You'll get this magic number, which you can then take to one of the FAA's testing providers. In my case, that was a company called PSI. They had a testing location about 20 minutes from my house. I was able to go on again in a website that was partying like it was 1999, but that did show me available testing dates allowed me to view different locations and ultimately sign up for one. You do have to pay $150 to take the test, you know, which I think drives a lot of the argument that this is just the man trying to suck a few more bits of gold out of its citizens. But in any event, I signed up probably about two weeks before taking the test. That's probably my tip number one that I read somewhere, which was you know, go out, find a date where you can take the test, get it booked even before you've studied at all. So you have a date there and you kind of have a fixed point that you can focus on and it sort of forces you to get the studying done. So with my date two weeks out, I watched a couple of recommended YouTube videos. I'll put links down below. Don't have any affiliation with these guys. Most of the videos I found on YouTube are trying to sell a larger training course, and but I didn't pay for any of that content. I would be careful and look at some of the dates of some of the stuff that's out there. You know, the one video that everyone refers to that I've linked down below also is from 2016-ish, so some of the content has changed, particularly the things about flying over people, uh, night operations, all of that. But you know, chart reading, weather, all that stuff is, is pretty static, and I think that video does a pretty good job explaining it. There's also a website that I'll link down below where you could take a practice test that I believe had about 30 questions. I think they were all called from a real FAA test bank. I found that to be very helpful, particularly because after each question, it would tell you if you got it right or wrong, and then give you some explanation around why you were right or wrong. You know, that helped me a ton with the charting stuff. I struggled a little bit with the latitude and longitude when I first started getting into the chart reading, and oddly enough, had precisely zero questions about latitude and longitude on my FAA test. So once you get yourself prepped up, you drive to the test center. They recommend arriving, I think, 15 minutes beforehand. In my case, it was in a pretty nondescript office building. Ultimately, you'd walk in and there was this you know, pretty generic and pretty bare bones room with a couple people in it. I had to you know, take out my electronic devices. I think I left my phone in, the, in my vehicle, but you know, my phone, my keys, everything went into this little red bag that they then locked up. I had to you know, literally take my pockets out and reverse them and show them that they were empty. I had to fill out some form that acknowledged I wasn't gonna do anything nefarious. I had to sign in. And then a nice lady explained the rules. There was essentially this sort of holding area where I did all that stuff. And there was the actual testing room, which was through another door. And it was a couple or three rolls of cubicles. Each one has a computer in it. In the case of the FAA drone test, you get a book, which you can download from the FAA's website that has sample charts, has a whole bunch of other information in it. You get a couple of pencils, since you're not allowed to bring your own writing implements. I got a dry erase marker, a dry erase eraser, and a piece of transparency. After the instructions, they kind of send you in. You sit down on this computer, you type a secret code in, you have to acknowledge some more stuff. You then get a little practice test, which is kind of helpful. I think the interface was somewhere between intuitive and kind of clunky, but the practice test lets you test some of the features. There's an ability to bookmark questions. So if you find something that you either have no clue on or you kind of want to go back and review, you can bookmark it, you can skip. And there's a, you know, I think the one thing that is worth paying attention to is that bookmarking feature. 
and then there's a button that lets you go from bookmark question to bookmark question. Once you get through that practice test, you click a few magic buttons, you're in the real test. Again, take advantage of that bookmark feature. I didn't really use the note paper they give you. They give you, you know, a couple of blue sheets where you can take notes until the end, where when I went back and looked at the questions that I bookmarked that I really had no clue on, I basically just wrote down A, B, C on the paper and tried to eliminate the ones that were obviously not correct. All the questions are multiple choice. They all have three answers. And usually there's one that you can kind of suss out as being wrong. You know, either they'll throw something ridiculous in there or, you know, it's, it's sometimes a case of one of these things does not look like the others. So that's the only thing I use the paper for. They also gave you a calculator. I didn't use the calculator at all. I use the transparency paper for some of the distance related questions. So they'll have chart questions where they'll say, you know, the radio tower 10 nautical miles southeast of whatever airport. There's a key in all the charts that has a distance scale. And I would just take my transparency paper and kind of mark off the 10 or 12 or whatever nautical miles that they wanted me to look. I generally think you could get by without that. You know, most of the cases where they say there's a tower, you know, five nautical miles northwest of some airport. There's only one tower out there, so it's pretty easy to find as long as you, you know, remember which way northeast, west, south are. You're allotted two hours to finish the test. I think I got done with all the questions on my first pass after about 45 minutes. I think I bookmarked like six or eight of them. So I went back and attempted to figure those out. And essentially I was all done after about 50 minutes. Now I've seen recommendations to go back and triple check your work and all that stuff. I certainly could have done that. I have plenty of time, but you know, I find if I go back and kind of overthink things, then I get into trouble. And you know, I also had some work to get done. So I hit the, you know, I'm done button. I think they make you go through a survey. You know, there's some sort of waiting icons where it spins the crank. It seemed to be a little bit intense for just being able to grade a 60 question multiple choice test. But ultimately you get a little screen that pops up that says, you know, hey, go see the proctor. You go back outside, that person unlocks your bag, lets you retrieve your, your stuff from in there, and gives you a paper, piece of paper that says you passed, in my case. Once you get that, you go home, the piece of paper has some instructions on there, you go to an FAA website, it ultimately found my test result, I had to key in a whole bunch of information, give it more of my you know, passport data or something like that, where I was born, all that stuff. And theoretically, it filled out a big old application for my official remote UAS pilot or airman certificate or whatever they call it that will ultimately be processed in they tell me seven to ten days. So that was my experience. You know, I would highly recommend studying. You know, again, I consider myself fairly smart and I took a sample test just cold and I was blown away. Um, you know, I think I got like 20% of the stuff right. The chart stuff is not really intuitive. You know, all the, the videos will mention that they do supply a key to the charts that helps you answer a bunch of the questions particularly all the air, airspace stuff. So you don't have to remember the different colors and all that. You know, you can go and look in the key and it'll tell you, you know, magenta is this class airspace and blue is this other class. But, you know, none of that stuff is really particularly intuitive. Even if you, like me, kind of fancy yourself as somebody that knows a bit about aviation, you know, spent a bunch of time playing flight simulator and all that sort of thing. But this is not anything about aviation. It's not about how airplanes work. It's not about aerodynamics. It's pretty much all about, can you read a chart? You know, can you understand radio frequencies? Can you understand what different symbols on the chart are telling you and how to react to those and how they impact your ability to fly a drone? So definitely study. I don't think you need to do a paid course or to you know turn this into a PhD dissertation, but that five to 10 hour study requirement is probably about right. And depending on your leanings, maybe you say, hey, you know, this is a free country. I'm not gonna deal with this nonsense. I'm not gonna send the FAA 150 bucks. I'm gonna do what I want with my drone. And you, know, you may or may not get some nasty gram in the mail telling you to take down videos or that you're doing something wrong. I'm not your lawyer, I'm not your accountant. Other than sending good vibrations your way and wishing that you as a fellow human succeed in life, I can't give you any advice on whether that's an appropriate path to take from a legal or practical or moral perspective. But this was my experience taking the drone test. Hopefully it was helpful to you. you know, hopefully it inspires you to at least go out there and register, get a date on the calendar. I think two weeks out was just about right in order to have a little bit of that, you know, uh oh, this thing is coming motivation combined with the I've got enough time to study. And with that, hopefully you'll see a wee bit of drone footage in my channel. You know, I do have a drone. I've been meaning to put some stuff in there. And then I did some Googling on drone videos on YouTube and found all this stuff about how, you know, the FAA is going to parachute into your house and demand you take down the videos if you put drone stuff out there. So hence my part 107. 
hence my soon to be licensed status and hence my hopefully soon to have a few more drone vids in here. With that, I wish you safe flying, whether as a remote pilot in command, which is the FAA terminology for somebody that's jockeying the sticks of a drone, or whether in your own other aviation endeavors. Safe travels, Big Heavy, signing out, wishing you peace. Ever wonder why every talking head on YouTube asks you to hit the like and subscribe button at the end of their video? You are right, because we're living in a computer simulation. And our benevolent robotic overlords get just a little bit of energy every time you hit that like. So, do me, the rest of civilization, and our benevolent robotic overlords a favor. Mash that subscribe, be kind to each other, keep living your simulated dreams.